Thank you, worship team. Let's open up with a word of prayer that you may be seated. Father God, thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, thank you just for the blessings you continue to give us day after day. We thank you for watching over us. We thank you for bringing us here safely, Lord. We thank you for the rain that you have provided. And just pray for those who are out on the road. We also pray for our our first responders who are out there in the weather, Lord. And just pray that you would be with them as well. Father, we thank you for all that you do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. That song gets me every time. That last song, that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come, that just speaks volumes of who the Lord is. That speaks to us as to what he is. He's not only holy, he's beyond holy. He's holy, holy. But even further than that, he's beyond the holier of the holy. He's the holiest. He's holy, holy, holy. Kadash, Kadash, Elo, Adonai, Elohim, Tava'o. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts is what they're chanting there. It's the same thing the angels chant in the presence of the Lord because he's so majesty, he's so majestic, and his presence demands that holiness. Today, we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about family. We're going to look at his definition of family. We're going to look at kinship, and we're going to look at community, which is what we are. We're a community of believers, but beyond that, we're a family of believers. And we're going to look at how Jesus defined the family unit to include all of us. Even though we may have no biological tie, we're still family. And we're going to see and we're going to look through scriptures how that came about. So first, how's everybody doing this morning? Oh, that was a good one. I didn't have to, I normally have to come back and say like, oh, that was weak. Let's just do it again for fun. How's everyone doing this morning? See, I didn't want to break the routine. I only get up here once or twice a year, so... It's the little things that matter. What was Jesus' view on the family unit? Jesus held a very complex view on the biological family and on its relationship. He respects the institution of marriage. He respects children. He loves children. He's compassionate towards children. But he's also challenging the traditional family loyalties when they are in conflict with devotion to God. Jesus affirmed the sanctity of marriage, stating, what therefore God has joined together let no man separate. That's Mark 10, 9. But he also welcomed and blessed children, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Mark 10, 14. However, Jesus also made some very surprising statements that I don't think diminish at all the family unit, the biological family unit, but I think if anything, they just add to it and they enhance it because they bring in another aspect to it. It makes the family unit now into a family of believers and a family of those who are following God's, God's will and God's word. He said, his true family consists of those who do God's will. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. That's Matthew 1250. He calls upon his disciples to prioritize following him over family obligations. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That's Luke 14, 26. He also gives us a warning. He gives us a pretty stark warning that following him could divide families and could cause friction. It can even cause something that might be unimaginable. He warns us that following him can divide us. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are stark words. That's um, that's a cold reality. Can you all imagine that? That following following the Lord could actually break apart a family? Or could cause division? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I'm sure many of you have felt that now or have felt that in the past. Many of y'all know the, uh, the groups that, that, uh, that I work with in, uh, in the Middle East and in uh, Southern Asia, uh, mainly in Pakistan. And uh, we see this quite often there, weekly as a matter of fact, every two or three days we, uh, we see this. Just four weeks ago, a young evangelist was invited by his brother, his cousins, and his uncles to go to a neighboring city to preach. The city was only about 65 kilometers away. It's a small village. They're, uh, they're based out of Abbottabad in Pakistan in northern Punjab. And uh, when he arrived there, he prayed about it. He knew the dangers of going to this city. But he prayed about it. And he was scared, and he did not want to go. But he prayed and prayed about it, and um, he felt led to go. And he went. The moment he arrived in the city, he was arrested, charged with blasphemy for burning a page of the Quran. It was a setup. His own brother and his, and his uncles and his family set him up. Why? Because he didn't adhere to their, their thought of religion. He was... Uh, he was beaten, he was killed, and he was burned in the street. You may think, what, what good could come of something like that? Well, four weeks before that, a, a shop owner named Walif owns a shoe factory and a, and a shop where he sells these sandals he makes. His crime was selling sandals 70 cents more than what the person wanted to pay. Again, this person went made a charge of blasphemy. He was arrested. His shop was burnt. His factory was torched. His family was, was kicked out of their home, and he was beaten in the street and left to die. He was taken to a hospital. He sat there for nine days with no medical attention and finally passed away. Again, why would you share something so tragic? Because nine days after that, his funeral procession involved over a thousand Christians walking through a Abbottabad. You don't do that in Pakistan. That was his family, his family of believers, against all odds and knowing the dangers of getting together, walked through this town, and uh, the video that I, that I, I could share with you all is them proclaiming Jesus lives, Jesus is good, hallelujah. And they marched through the entire town all the way to the cemetery and bury this man. Again, what good could come of that? How many people shut their doors and all they heard was Jesus is good, Jesus is God. Hallelujah. Marching down the street, even though they shut their doors and didn't want to hear it, that word was still there. What they did was they proclaimed this is our family and nothing is going to stop us from celebrating our family member's life. There's no doubt in my mind that many will come to the Lord because of those sacrifices. It's, all for, it's not for not. There's a reason and there's a purpose to everything. Everything we do has a reason and has a purpose. And that goes right back to this family thing we're talking about. Because when Jesus constituted this family, this family of believers, he meant for us to be and act just like a biological family. He meant for us to be as close as a biological family. He meant for us to rely on each other just like a brother would rely on his biological sister or a sister on her brother or a mother on a father. That's what we're supposed to be. So we have the model of the biological nuclear family, but we also have this model of a family of believers. And this is what Jesus conceives. It's a new family united by faith rather than blood. He refers to this community as his true family, saying, behold, my mother, my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That's Mark 3, 34 and 35. Jesus emphasized that this spiritual family would transcend all natural family ties. He promised that those who left their families for his sake would receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. That's Luke eighteen thirty. Notice I'm not talking about wealth. That's not what I'm talking about when I say that he's promised that you're going to receive everything. Because the stories that I just shared with you, there's nothing wealthy about those. Except the souls that will, that will receive and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of that. That's the true wealth. But that's not earthly wealth. 
That's eternal wealth. We're going to come back to that eternal wealth and eternal worth here in a moment. He taught his disciples to call God their father, creating a new family identity for them. That's Matthew 6 and 9. He referred to his disciples as little children in John 13, 33, and friends, John 15, 15. He's establishing this intimate familial bonds with his disciples and with his followers because they're not just followers. They've been adopted into his family. You and I are part of that family if we've chosen to, to believe and to place our faith and trust in the resurrected Son of God, Jesus Christ. If we've made that decision, then we're part of that family. So what kind of a member are we? Are we a good brother? Are we a good sister? Are we a good mother, a good father, a good grandparent? Are we a good child? If God the Father is our father, how are we in respect to being a good child? How does this family grow? So we've talked about this family. We say that as a family of believers, we are a family. How do we grow our family? Traditionally, a biological family, there's marriages, there's, there's, uh, there's weddings, there's children being born, and that's the way a family grows. Generations go on and generations and generations. But how do we as a family of believers grow? Two words, discipleship, evangelism. Why? The most, most of the time you'll hear evangelism and discipleship. But the truth is I don't believe that you can practice good evangelism unless you've been discipled. I think once we've been discipled, once we've gotten to the point that we realize I'm supposed to love the Lord, I'm supposed to love my neighbor, and I'm supposed to go and make disciples. Once that becomes our lifestyle, our habit, it becomes second nature to us. And we begin to do it without even thinking. We begin to look around and spot people in line. You begin to spot people at the gas station when you're pumping gas at HEB and there's a person right next to you. You're standing there for three or four minutes. You can just say hello. If they say hello back, hey, that's a conversation starter. If they just look at you and kind of grunt, then don't, don't follow that conversation. <laughs> but because I've gotten that one too. But more often than not, they'll just say, hey, how are you doing? And then maybe you can complain about the gas price or something. But it opens up a conversation. And just the, hey, how are you doing? How's your day going? Can be wonders for a person that's having a terrible day. He commissioned his followers to go. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's Matthew 28, 19. That's the beginning of what we call the Great Commission. That's 19 and going on. But before that, it begins with all authority has been given to me. So Jesus is saying all authority has been given to me. Then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have taught you. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. But it begins with all authority has been placed in me. So when we make that decision to follow him, we recognize that we're placing all authority in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're releasing that from ourselves. We're no longer to try to do things in our own strength, in our own will. Because now we're supposed to try to do them according to God's will. That's not easy. Why? Because we're stubborn people and we like to do things our own ways. I see a big smile over there. So I'm not, I'm not going to say who it was, but I saw you smiling. <laughs> he emphasized the importance of teaching believers, saying, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's the last verse I just read. Those verses are what should be our lifestyle. It should be a thought. It should begin with a thought. I'm going to do something good today. I'm going to do something today that I didn't do yesterday, and I, or I didn't, I'm going to do something today that I did yesterday, but today I'm going to try and enhance it. Yesterday I prayed when I woke up. Today I'm going to pray a little bit longer. Maybe I'm going to pray and read a few, a few scriptures or open up a devotion. Things like that. Little things. Little thoughts become actions. Actions become what? If you do something over and over and over, it'll become your habit. If you have a habit, it's pretty hard to kick. If you have a habit, guess what that becomes? That becomes your lifestyle. Guess what your lifestyle is? 
Your lifestyle is what people are going to remember you from. That's your legacy. It's that simple. Thought, action, habit, lifestyle, legacy. So simple. But that can also go other ways. And that can also bring in some, some very destructive habits. Because the word habit has a negative connotation to it for a reason. But if it's a habit of prayer, if it's a habit of familial worship, if it's a habit of coming and, and being with the body of believers, I think those are good habits to have. And if that's your lifestyle, bless you. That is a great lifestyle to have. So how do we do this? What are some practical ways that we as a congregation can grow this family? What are some practical ways that we can be better family members to one another? We can encourage family worship. We make it a daily routine. Uplift family worship that includes Bible reading, prayer, and spiritual discussions. Notice that many times when I say family here, it's going to be interchangeable with church. Make it a daily routine. Uplift church worship, corporate church worship. That includes Bible reading, prayer, and spiritual discussions. We do that. Well, we do that here. We're doing that now. But will you do that tonight? And will you do that tomorrow in your own home? Will you take what we do here and bring that into your home? Because guess what? If you have that same repetition of things, guess what? Those habits form a lot quicker. So if we're worshiping here on Sunday morning and Wednesday evening, and that's it, we still have a whole bunch of days in between there where we get to forget everything that we learned and everything we did on Sunday to Wednesday. It's almost like it's just a little pick-me-up, a little shot in the arm on that Wednesday to get you through the week. It gets you to Sunday, then you go back over, then you go back over, then you go back over. But if that was a habit, if that was a lifestyle, if there was a culture of worship in our families and in our homes, it would be like you never left this building. It would be like we never left each other. Why? Because it'd still be a family of believers. Except now it may be your family, your children, and, and your wife, and your husband versus your friends. But it's still there. We foster open communication. We make an environment where family members can talk openly about their faith, personal spiritual growth, and doubts. It's okay to have doubts. What's not okay is to have doubts and not talk about them. Because then those doubts grow. We have to foster a culture where we can talk about that. We can talk about how we're growing. We can talk about our doubts. We can talk about our struggles. We can talk about our victories. We affirm and value each family member. We show appreciation for each person's unique qualities, encourage them towards activities with eternal worth and eternal reward. You know, somebody that's a talented musician, let's encourage them to maybe hang out with the worship team. Let's encourage them to serve. Let's encourage them to use their gifts and talents in a way that is honoring and in a way that is eternally worthy. Not something that's going to fall apart and decay here on this planet, but build up an eternal wealth. Plan special times together. Organize family vacations and activities and spiritual outreach that allow for bonding and possible evangelistic possibilities. Model forgiveness and reconciliation. Demonstrate how to forgive and reconcile within the family slash church, reflecting Christ's teachings. This one's important. Reclaim mealtime. Use family meals as opportunities for meaningful discussions and spiritual growth. One of my favorite things coming here on Wednesday evening is we have a familial meal. We all get to sit down. We all, we all eat together. We fellowship. And then we have our Bible study. We have a time of prayer. That's an amazing evening plan. What if you did that on Thursday at home? If you ate with your family, then had a small time of devotion after your meal? Is that a way that we can take what we do here into our homes? Everything we're trying to do is to grow this culture of the family, this culture of the family of believers, where what we do here is the same that we do outside. Because guess what? Once you go out, once you leave your home and you're at the store, or you're somewhere else, or you're at your work, the people around you, you're going to begin to wonder, you should be part of my family. Do you know the Lord? Once you begin to see their struggles, once you begin to see everything that is going on with them, provide training and resources. 
Offer parents tools and guidance to help them cultivate faith in their families. This is more of a church one. Family week begins tonight. What is the whole purpose of family week? It's everything we're talking about. It is to strengthen those familial bonds, and it is to share with our family and let our family know that one, you are important, two, you matter, you have value, and three, we're all on this journey together. And if one of you is struggling or I'm not, or if I'm struggling where you're not, let's hold each other up and let's pull each other along as a family, like a family should. You would do that for any of your biological siblings. Let's do it for each other. Create faith and and bond building interactions. Facilitate activities where parents and children interact with each other and other families in church community. Well, that's kind of like what we're doing here. That's what we're going to be doing tonight. But again, that doesn't have to stay here. Those are things that you can do at home. Those are things that you can take out of here. Encourage a culture of prayer. This is something I do love about this congregation. Promote regular prayer individually, corporately between spouses, involve the children, and this will strengthen family bonds and encourage spiritual growth. That is one of the things I love about this congregation. One of the first things I noticed coming here was there is a culture of prayer at Stonebridge. There are some prayer warriors here. There's, there's people praying in that room right over there right now as we speak, praying for us, praying for each of us, praying for our employment, praying for our, that we make it home safely, praying for Lorraine, praying for me that I don't jumble up too many words. But they're right there praying for us. Wednesday night after the meal and after the Bible study, we have a time of corporate prayer where we all get together and pray together. We get together and talk to God together. That's amazing that we even have that opportunity to do that. We don't need a mediator. We don't need anything. We have a direct line to the Father. Jesus himself has told them, ask him my name. But again, why can't that be a culture that we do at home? Why can't we pray as a family? If we do it here on a Wednesday night, why can't we do it on Tuesday? Or on a normal Sunday night? Even if it's a normal, if it's just a single Sunday dinner, why can't we do it there? Engage in service and missions. Involve families in a mission or mission trips to broaden their perspective and deepen their faith. We set clear family values. This one's important because uh, we were talking about this in our Sunday school. God is love. And through mercy and through grace, we, we are able to be forgiven of our sins. But it's not a free excuse to continue down that road. So that's something that we have to be, be mindful of is that, yes, God will forgive us and God offers grace and Jesus is, is love, but there's also a set of rules that we're, we're kind of expected to follow and we're expected to live by if we want to, to say, yes, I'm a believer or yes, I'm a follower of Christ. So what are some examples of those rules? What if we were to live my life under the lordship of Jesus Christ in every area? Accept the word of God as my authority for faith and for daily living. Love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind and strength. Love my neighbor as myself. Glorify God by advancing the gospel in my community and throughout the world. Follow godly leaders and counselors as they are led by the Holy Spirit and the teachings of the word of God to be equipped for service. Maintain the unity of my family by acting in love towards others with humility and patience. Support the spreading and preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ through prayer and through the giving of my time, talents, and treasures. Serve the Lord and others for the building up of the body. That list I just read to you, do do any of those sound familiar? This can be an interactive part. We did this last night. So you're allowed to talk here. Just don't tell Pastor Kevin I did this. Do those sound familiar to anybody? Randy? It's our church covenant. Yes. Well, last night he said from the Bible. So we got both answers. Yes, they are from the Bible. They have a source. But yeah, they're from our church covenant. This is what Stonebridge has said. We want to follow these, these guidelines. These are what we want. This is what we expect, but this is also what we strive to because we may not be there. And I guarantee you there's other places here in this other long list I just read to you all where I'm lacking. So 
this message goes for me just as much as it is for you. Because I need to do better. I said last night, if you ever find somebody that comes up here and says they have everything together, turn around and run out the building. That's not where you need to be. Because none of us do. But what, what we do is try to strive and try to move forward and try to follow the word of God and try to be the best family member I can be. Why? Because I have younger brothers and I have younger sisters that might be looking up to me. And I have brothers and sisters that maybe need my help. Or maybe I need their help. And if we're oblivious to each other's needs, that'll never happen. So it's kind of a new definition for family, isn't it? We've really expanded what we think of, oh, this is my family. Which is, I think, encouraging. It's encouraging to know that I'm part of something that is bigger than just me. I'm bigger, something that is bigger than just genetics. Something that is bigger than, oh, that is my biological father, my biological mother, my sister, my brother, my half-sister, my half-brother, however that may be. This is something bigger and stronger. And it transcends all of those bonds and all of those, those restrictions where you're my sister just like you're my brother. So, let's act like a family. Let's do what we do here as a church family and take that into our own families at home. And I guarantee you, not only will it strengthen your family at home, it'll strengthen this family. Because it won't just be a Sunday, Wednesday. We will have already been going through it the whole week. And when you arrived here, you'd be ready to go. We would all be. As we conclude... I just want us to think about that. What is this definition? What is this family? And is this something that I, want, I even want to be part of? Is this something that is for me? Is this something that is not for me? Is this something that sounds nice but can't be true? If that's your thought, I encourage you. I encourage you to talk. Talk with me. And I can show you how it can be true. So as we conclude... I just want us to think about that. As we go into our family week tonight, tomorrow, all the way through Wednesday, you're going to be hearing many of these same examples that I just went through. You're going to hear Brother Luke talk about it. You're going to hear Brother Chuck talk about it. You're going to hear myself talk about it on Tuesday. But it's all going to come back to the same thing. It's about family. We're family. But in order for this church family to be strong, guess what? Our individual families need to be strong. Because there's no way that a bunch of broken families can come together and unite as a functioning family. It has to go everywhere. It can't just be here. We can't just do church here. There's, there's not enough time to just sit inside these four walls and be comfortable. We're running short on time, folks. Other people in other countries, recognize that. I'm, I'm blessed to live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. I love this country. But we have it pretty easy. And at times I wonder, maybe if we had it a little bit harder, this would be a little bit easier. Just like the people I see in other places. So as we conclude today, let's reflect on Jesus' profound redefinition of the family. He calls us to prioritize spiritual kinship this is Jesus inviting us into a family united by faith and obedience to God's will, to his will. The most beautiful part is that this invitation extends to everyone, regardless of background or past mistakes. This is for you. If this wasn't true, I couldn't stand up here today because of my past and my past mistakes would automatically disqualify me from ever being anywhere near this pulpit as I believe most of the people that have stood behind this pulpit are. If you have not yet experienced that love and that belonging that comes from being part of God's family, I encourage you that today's the perfect day to experience that. And today's the perfect day to respond. We're going to have a time of invitation and a time of prayer. And I just want us to reflect on that. I want us to reflect on our families our biological families, our church family, 
and how the two mesh together? And how do the two look? How different does this church family look from our own families at home? How different does our family at home look from this church? They should look alike. They really should. They should really mimic each other. There should really be no difference from when you come from your home to when you come to your family of believers because we're all still brothers and sisters. We're going to close with a time of invitation and a time of response. And we'll have a couple of brothers up here, a couple of deacons will be up here. And uh, if you'd like to talk with them, if you'd like to pray with them, if you're thinking, maybe I need to be part of this family. Or maybe you're just thinking, I just want some more information about this family. I encourage you to please come up here. Please talk with them. Talk with me. There's going to be an email address up here behind me, info at stonebridgesa.com. If you're not comfortable with asking the question, you're not comfortable with standing up, coming up in front of people, that's okay. That's totally okay. Send a message there. Or if you have one of, one of our leader's numbers, call us, text us. We'll gladly talk with you. We may not have the answers, but I do commit to find the answer with you. I won't know it all, but I guarantee I'll walk with you and help you find it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that, all that you are, all that you do, all that you have done, and all that you will do. I thank you for the opportunity to have this decision, a decision that can change a life. Jesus, you offer forgiveness, you offer hope, and you offer us a place in your eternal family. Lord, I pray that if anybody does not know you, they would accept this invitation from you. Just by placing their trust in you, we repent of our sins and we commit to follow you. That's all it takes to join this family of believers. Together we can grow in faith, love, service, and work. We can work together to expand God's family. Discipleship, evangelism, words that should strike a new meaning to us because it's not just about meeting strangers. It's not just about sharing your word. It's about inviting and bringing new people into the family of faith, into the family of believers, and into the eternal family that has been set and ordained by our Father, our Lord God. I invite you today, if you have any questions, any thoughts, to ask to speak with one of our deacons, to speak with me, to send us a message, or maybe it's just something to meditate on and think about and come back to. Whatever it is, I do pray that the scriptures we read today, the words that we heard today, would resonate with us. This definition of family, this definition of faith, this culture of growth, this culture of love, culture of forgiveness, and most of all, a culture of faith and prayer. Father, I thank you for this blessing. I thank you for this opportunity to stand here. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.